In this video, we are going to be covering five different rulings or calls that can happen during a softball game. The five are going to include obstruction versus interference, the look back rule, drop third strike, does the tie go to a runner, and what is the ruling when a catcher hits a batter trying to throw to third base. So my guest today, umpire Grace, is going to be leading the way. Hello, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Grace. I have been a softball umpire since the age of 14. I just wrapped up season 21, and I believe I umpired over 200 games this season. I umpire all age groups, all levels. I still umpire the eight and 10 year olds, and I love to do it. I umpire travel ball tournaments. I umpire college showcases, high school, JV, middle school, and next year will be my first year at the collegiate level. So in this video series, I will be answering, um, sort of generally speaking, because around the country and depending on who's going to view this video, you might be under a different rule set than I am and that I'm trained to do and uh, where my knowledge is based. So I hope you learned something from the videos that I'm about to put forth, and I hope it maybe sparks your interest in someday becoming an umpire. All right, let's get right into it with interference versus obstruction. First thing you need to remember is that with interference, it is an immediate dead ball and the umpire should follow their call with who's out and why. In obstruction, it's a delayed dead ball and we're gonna need to see what the outcome of the play is in order to make a final call. So in obstruction, it is a delayed dead ball and my left arm is going out. I am going to say obstruction, but I'm not going to scream it at a game stopping volume because again, it's a delayed dead ball and obstruction occurs when the defender who is not in possession of the ball impedes a runner in any way. You will see this a lot of times at first base, especially in the younger divisions where that first base person is just on their bag when the ball is nowhere near, there's no play at first pace. If that batter runner um, runs into her or has to go around her and shouldn't have to, then that's going to be obstruction. And she cannot be called out if she's past first base at second base. Obstruction is between the two bases where it occurred. So it doesn't last all the way around the bases. And that's another important thing to remember. An exception to that is if the umpire believes that if that obstruction didn't occur, she would have made it to third base or she would have made it home. They can, in fact, make the ultimate ruling on that. If we're talking about catcher's obstruction, then in my opinion, we are talking about one of the most serious safety issues that's on the field. So catcher obstruction occurs when the batter takes a swing and the catcher's glove, body, helmet, any part of the catcher interferes with that swing. Now, it's also an example of where the delayed dead ball would be crucial because under certain circumstances, they can swing that bat and they can still knock it out of the park. So that's why you put a delayed dead ball because the offense is going to want to choose the outcome of that play, which would be that out of the park home run. It doesn't matter to me what the age group is. I'm checking in with each catcher directly after that call is made and being sure, do you understand the call that I made? Because at the end of the day, we don't want our catchers to be hurt. There's a reason that this is in place. And sometimes they can wind up with an injury and a penalty and it's like too much. So we wanna just protect safety wise our catchers and that's why we have that rule in place. Okay, now back to interference. Again, when it occurs, it is an immediate dead ball. One thing somebody told me over the years is if you're calling a dead ball, umpire Grace, you better be able to immediately follow it with your reasoning and your words. So I always think about that when I call interference, but at the same time, I know it when I see it and I am killing this play. So what's the definition of interference in the million dollar question? Does the runner have to touch the fielder in order to commit interference? The answer is no, absolutely not. The definition of interference is if the runner impedes, hinders, or confuses the defender in any way. A common location for interference to occur is at shortstop. So we have a runner on second base taking a lead, hard ground ball hit, things can happen very fast. She can attempt not to trip her up, 
But in my head, if I think that her actions caused a reaction from the shortstop or from the defender, then I'm likely calling interference. It is game stopping volume and I'm saying dead ball, interference, this runner is out. Do I also find it difficult to call interference and obstruction? Yes, I do, because sometimes they can happen right on top of each other, but that is my job as an umpire. I am out there to make judgment calls. I have to decide which one of those things happened first. So I gotta make a call, that's part of my job, that's what I'm trained to do, um, and 50% of the people are gonna be happy. The look back rule. All right, so it goes into effect when either the batter is put out or when the batter reaches first base and the ball is in the circle. The ball's gotta be in the circle and the pitcher, not a substitute for the pitcher, the pitcher, the person listed in the lineup in the pitching position has to have control of the ball in the circle. It applies to all runners on the field um, at the same time and they must immediately make a decision and head to a base. So they cannot trip themselves up and change directions. They'll be out on the look back rule. They can't stop for more than a second. What I do, she stops. I see the pitcher has control. I go one Mississippi. If I make it through that count, I'm calling her out for the look back rule. Now, what people get very excited about is whether or not the pitcher has made a play. Because if the pitcher attempts to make a play on any one of those runners, then the look back rule is no longer in effect. And they do have the ability to change directions and change their minds on which base they want to go back to. That being said, people can use the definition pretty fast and loose of making a play. My definition of making a play is if the actions of the pitcher have caused a reaction from the runner, then the look back rule is off because she's making a play. People get very excited about this very quickly because if you see it on your end, you expect it to be called. Okay, drop third strike. Now, the definition is going to tell you that it's actually an uncaught third strike. So the verbiage can be a little unfair to catchers because she can scoop something real clean, but the drop third strike is still going to be in effect if it touched the ground first. So I'm going to tell you what probably all your coaches tell you. If you're unsure, just start making the move to first base because I'm going to either say strike three, bat is out, or strike three. So the absence of the batters out should give you an indication that that was an uncaught third strike. I can look for help from my partner if I have one. He or she can point down if it's uncaught or give me one of these real quick um, because my view behind the plate may be obstructed. So uncaught third strike, the batter becomes a batter runner and she can be put out by tag or by force at first base. But only if the circumstances are, there are less than two outs and first base is not occupied. If there are less than two outs and first base is occupied, the batter is going to be out, and you should hear that from the umpire. Batter's out. If there's two outs and first base is occupied, anything goes, and the drop third strike is on. Now that runner from first base is now forced to second base. Yes, hello, it's umpire Grace debunking a classic. Does the tie go to the runner? No, God, no. It actually does not go to the runner. That has been passed down, not in umpire trainings, through years and years of our baseball and softball culture here in America. But guess what? The umpire has to make a call regardless. There's no such thing as a tie. I know, I know, but someone did something first. The end.
All right. If the catcher is attempting to make a play on a runner at third base, that batter, if she interferes in any way, she's going to be okay. There's going to be no interference called if she is in the batter's box. If she is not in the batter's box, then she's going to be called for interference. If she's hit by this throw, or if she interferes with the catcher's ability to make this play in any way, or confuses the catcher. Exceptions to that would be, it can be called interference in the box if the umpire has ruled that it was an intentional interference. Um, and that is not commonplace. That's not typically what it is. As an ump, and this could be um, varied throughout the country or different um, sanctions in which you play, but in order for me to make this call of interference, I've got to see both feet of this batter outside of the box. This can be a tough one because if this batter is out of the box and she interferes, or if she's in the box, she can wind up with an injury. So this is like safety number one. But if she's out of the box, she can wind up with an injury and a penalty. And nobody wants to see that. And um, I've been in a situation where the coaches don't know the rule on this and sort of accused me of just being awful to this player and really nice blue um, because I did have to call her out, unfortunately, although she was injured. I do like to see awareness from the batter, an attempt to get out of the way, um, but you technically don't have to. But I just like the most safe environment on the on the field that we can we can have. So I do appreciate just the batter's knowledge of the situation, well aware that there's a runner on third base and um, doing their best to avoid this.